side for Vieira, who will play it through to Gabriel Jesus, who's in here for Arsenal, Gabriel Jesus to finish it off, oh what a way to do it, Gabriel Jesus seals the points for Arsenal, he's back and he's back with a bang, into the penalty area it goes, Gabriel Keller and it's into the back of the net, Arsenal take an early lead through Gabriel. You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna. The Daily Arsenal Podcast with me, Harry Simeon. Hey everybody, how's it going? Hope you're all good. Hope you're well. Welcome back to another episode of the Chronicles of a Guna podcast with me, your host, Harry Simeon. I have to apologize in advance for the echo that you're going to get throughout this episode. I'm in a really echoey room. As you can see, I'm on the move today, so I don't have uh, the usual setup with me. So if I'm coming through a little bit echoey, apologies. Um, but to make up for that, I've brought a very special guest on. It's a treat for you guys. Mike Stavrou is back. Mike, welcome back to the pod. How you doing? Thanks, mate. I've got a better setup than you, so listeners can enjoy my voice a little more than yours. <laughs> I'm not even going to argue with you on this occasion. <laughs> um, how you been? How you feeling ahead of the new season? We're less than a week out now. Yeah, good. Uh, we were just talking off air saying that we're really excited, but now we're back into it properly with under a week to go. I think we're we're feeling the the weight of it as we as we work in this industry. When it gets busy, we're really busy. But you know that's just part of the territory, isn't it? But overall, I'm I'm looking forward to it and I'm excited. I just want to see actual football again because I can't watch another preseason game. It's hard, isn't it, with preseason? Because I always find in the build up to each and every one of those fixtures. There's a part of you that's really excited to watch your team play. And in particular, if you've got new players, you can't wait to see them and how they get on and how they look in the kit and, you know, what you're going to be able to learn about them from even a a small cameo appearance of 15, 20 minutes in some cases. But then you turn up to these games and invariably they're crap and there isn't much to go sort of away raving about there isn't many lessons learned I always find anyway I've tried to take some lessons from Arsenal's couple of games particularly here at Emirates Stadium but you're not really going to know where you're at until the opening day of the season when we take on Premier League opposition with something at stake and it's very very difficult to kind of replicate those scenarios I think in these pre-season friendly so I do find this time of year quite difficult um how are you feeling generally? Look, we're going to do a bit of a season preview, but I don't want to do the whole X is going to be the top scorer, Y is going to be the top assister. I don't want to do all of that because there's so many variables that come into play with that stuff. But I wanted to start off by gauging your general mood ahead of the 24-25 campaign because Arsenal went very close last season, closer than they did the season before. The only natural step really, Mike, is is to go on and win it. Are you feeling optimistic, positive? Is there an expectation on your part for Arsenal to go out there and get the job done? How are you feeling? I'm feeling ultra positive. And uh, now I say that, I'm kind of scared <laughs> because I feel like we've not gone in with this positivity that we can actually challenge for the league in years. I'm talking like decades. So it's been a long time and it's an unusual feeling. But the last two seasons, I mean, last season, I thought we would struggle because I think the, the season before was so unexpected how how well we did that I thought we were going to struggle to to match that. Um, but it turns out we didn't. And we went all the way to the final day. And like on the final day, it was such a feeling of elation and, you know, disappointment, of course, because we, we knew it probably wasn't going to happen and it didn't end up happening. But the fact that we were there was a huge step in the right direction. So I think this season, everyone's just really excited to see what we can do. And I think... It really shows you the reaction to um, the transfers because I think if last season would by this stage with five days to the new season, if we'd only had signed one defender, I feel like there would be turmoil. Um, The fans would be fighting with each other. Um, You know, (laughs) there'd be all that bitterness that we usually see. But I think because we are where we are and we've had this season we've just had, plus we made those big signings last summer. The squad's in a much better position and we're not at that stage where we're saying we need a striker to to compete for the league or we need this or that to compete for the league because we know we can already do it 
So the, the feeling is completely different. I, I guess the, the question then shifts to what could help us push us a step further than when we went and make up that two point deficit that we had. And we can have arguments about that, about there's marginal gains to be made in defence, which I think we made in midfield and probably in attack as well. But in terms of my overall feeling and what I feel that we can achieve, it's it's right at the, at the best it could be. I'm feeling positive too. I was on a show earlier today um, here at 90 Min where the guys were trying to, as they always do at the start of every season, get me to commit to some prediction involving Arsenal so that they can clip it up and basically put it out if we fail to achieve what I say we're going to achieve. And, and I wouldn't say today that Arsenal are definitely going to win the Premier League. But that doesn't mean I'm not positive or optimistic about what the new season's going to bring. I think we're going to be right up there. I think we're going to push Manchester City. But I still think it's right that Pep Guardiola's side, who will be bidding to win their fifth Premier League title in a row, who will go down as arguably the greatest Premier League side of all time, given the points tallies that they've managed during that period. I still think it's right that they are the favourites going into the new season. Now, that's not me trying to take away the pressure from Arsenal and trying to divert it elsewhere. But I don't know about you. I haven't seen enough from Manchester City to say that they're going to take a step backwards, which means we definitely win the league. I think it's going to be tight. I think it's going to be close. You talked about marginal gains that we require. What I will say about that is that for me, I think, yeah, of course, sometimes you can make those gains in the transfer market, but the transfer market isn't the be all and end all. I think we can still improve. I think we can improve our efficiency in front of goal at times. Um, I think defensively we were great, but we still had our moments, obviously. Um, so yeah, I think that those marginal gains and those steps forward can be made internally as well. How are you feeling about the transfer window so far? Obviously, there's still time to go. And I really do believe, Mike, that Arsenal would do further business. I think another couple of players will come in. But at the time of recording this, we've only got Ricardo Calafiori in the door. Emil Smith-Rowe's gone. Eddie and Ketia could be going. Reese Nelson's been linked with a move away. We don't really know what the future holds for Aaron Ramsdale and various others. It's hard to rank a window or rate a window at this point in it. But do you feel like Arsenal could have done more up to this stage to, to strengthen their title challenge? So I feel like just given the investment that has been put into this squad as it stands, um, I think I said last time there'd been... £240 million spent on the 11 defenders that Arteta signed since he came in. And that's just defence. You know, we've spent £100 million on Declan Rice and £70 million on Kai Havertz and other areas. So there's been a lot of investment over the years. And I think at the end of the day, like the owners are going to want to see that we can sell as well. I think that was always going to be a reality of this project that at some stage when developing all of these players we were going to have to sell some of them off. And I think actually we're in a pretty decent position that we're not having to sell one of our best players like Gabriel Martinelli or a Bukayo Saka or a William Saliba. I think that's that's a positive, right? Because I think if the project hadn't been at the stage it is now where we've challenged for the league title and gone all the way to the last day, if we hadn't quite got that far, I think that pressure will be ramped up for them to say, OK, you've done really well, but you're not quite at that stage where you can finish the job now and get the Premier League title. But the fact we are almost there is, is a good thing. But what they will want to see and what any businessman, any investor will want to see is a return on investment. And the fact that this window we have looking like going to have sold two players for a decent amount of money, which we haven't done historically. We've never been able to get consistent fees for our players. If Smith, Smith Rowe's gone, if Eddie goes as well for the fee that they're talking about, 30 million euros, that's a pretty decent deal. And I think showing that we can sell to some extent is really important. So that that's the boring side out of the way. Um, but am I enamoured with the signings? I mean, Calafiori, I think, is really interesting. I think he poses um, a lot of threat to opponents. And I think he poses selection headaches as well, which is good because he can play as that back up to Gabriel centre-back or he can play left-back. And that just gives us you know, different scenarios for how we want our team to set up, how we want to build up, um, how we want to defend, uh, how what our shape's going to look like, things like that. But I'd be lying if I said to you that I didn't want more reinforcements at this stage. You know, because because ultimately, if we sign a Mikel Marino, he's probably not going to be ready for the first few games of the season. And 
you know, we've seen from, from previous years, you really need to start building up that momentum in the first few games of the season. And I feel like a player like that could have really helped us. Um, and it's just about bedding them in, isn't it, ultimately? Because what did we see from Kai Havertz last season? We saw that we tried him in midfield and it really didn't work. And I think that, you know, adjustment period harmed his confidence and he looked a shell of the player that he is now. Um, so I think getting them in early and doing that business early is important. That's not happened. So there is a bit of disappointment there, but, you know, I'm not throwing my toys at the pram. I know there's still time. And I can sense that they wanted to see deals done first before they started bringing those players in. So we've got to hope that these deals go over the line so we can do a bit more business. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Um, in fact, I agree with what you're saying on the whole. It does seem a little bit underwhelming, but I'm, I'm just trying to figure out in my own mind whether that's because I think we really need those recruits and I don't believe that without them, we're capable of challenging for the title again or, or going one step further and pipping Manchester City to the post. Or if it's just because we've gotten used to, in recent summers, making transformative signings, bringing in big players for big amounts of money. And now that we've kind of put our foot on the brake a little bit in terms of that investment and, you know, it, we were always going to come to a point where we needed less investment because lots of the heavy lifting had already been done. I'm just wondering if we've come to that natural point and it's just the mindset thing. You know, Mikel Arteta will have reviewed last season, along with Edu, along with everybody else involved in the sporting operation. And they'll have an idea internally of where they think Arsenal fell short. And, you know, then it's up to them. Do they think that they can bridge that gap between where they are and where they want to be by tweaking things internally? Can they rely on some of the young players that are coming through? Can Ethan Waneri be a midfield option going forward? Can Miles Lewis Skelly be an option going forward? These are players that have featured prominently in pre-season for Arsenal. I don't know. That's that's the thing, isn't it? We don't know what the the kind of assessment looks like of last season. And therefore, we don't really know what the plan is. We're just sitting there going, come on, do some business, do some business. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's almost the way that football fans have been, I think, conditioned to look at things. Problem in the team or an area that needs improving? It's as if the training ground doesn't exist and that coaching can bring no benefit. All we think about is transfers, transfers, transfers. And yeah, I'm, I'm struggling to kind of get my head around the position that we find ourselves in. Yeah, there's so many factors to consider when you're talking about a transfer as well. And, you know, a big narrative, I think, throughout this summer and definitely previous windows has been PSR as well. I think that's a really important thing to consider. It's so boring. Don't get me wrong. Like, I hate talking about PSR, but it is a real thing that clubs have to think about now and at least it's going to be getting changed those rules soon so we don't have to worry about it for too long but you know balancing the books is is really really important and unfortunately um the rules at the moment prioritize the selling of, of academy players because it shows up as pure profit in, in the books which is why we've seen i think or maybe one of the factors in why we're seeing smith rowe and, and enkesio go and then as, as well as the financial considerations you have to think about squad harmony i think arteta um, James McNicholas did an incredible piece on The Athletic talking about how Arteta's built this team and his image. Um, and one of the first things was the cultural reset and looking to get players out that didn't quite fit into his philosophy and how we saw the, how we saw the club running on to, on, in his image, basically. And we talked about, you know, players like uh, Aubameyang and, and Mesut Ozil, who didn't, you know, necessarily buy into what he was trying to do. Um, and the fact that he's curated this, um, winning mentality at the club. He talks about his non-negotiables and stuff like that. It's such an important thing when you're looking at transfers, not only the ability of the player, but the mentality and how that slots in with the rest of the squad. Is, is it going to upset the harmony of the squad? Um, is it a player that's going to get upset if he doesn't play, you know, 25 games a season in, in the Premier League? I think all of these things are, are so important to consider that I'm not surprised if we're being really selective over who we choose to bring in as well as profiles. And then tactically as well, I feel like Arteta is, he, like James says in the piece, that he he leads on a lot of transfers with, with Edu. So he's got a clear idea of what he wants to bring in. So it's really interesting. And we've spoken about this a lot of times. Like where do they see Declan Rice playing? Because we've heard about Mikel Marino. So does that mean that Rice plays as more of a number six? But some of us think that he's better as a number eight. So there's all these considerations that come to talking about a transfer it's not just like oh I like this player from this club he's really good I think he can do a job there's so much to consider there is indeed uh, there is indeed I do want to 
sort of focus in on what you think, and, and I'll chip in as well, of course, are Arsenal's strengths and weaknesses going into the 24-25 campaign. We'll start off on a positive with strengths. Um, we saw a lot of good things last season. We saw a lot of great defensive work. We saw brilliant offensive play. We saw, um, you know, different partnerships in midfield thriving at different points in the season. There's so much to be pleased about and so much to carry forward in a positive light. If, if I asked you off the top of your head, what do you see as Arsenal's biggest strengths? What would be the first kind of things that come to mind that you would reel off? I think, I think mentality. Mentality is the number one thing, I think, because we've always had talented teams under Arsene Wenger. You know, we had some of the most technically gifted players in the in the squad, but the criticism that was always levied at Arsenal was that they had a soft underbelly. And I think one of the most satisfying things about these last few years has just been changing that perception. And, you know, we're not laughed at anymore. The, the banter era is well and truly gone. Um, and, you know, having that respect and having that, fearsome mentality so that when you're behind in games you can come back seeing out one nil leads going down to 10 men and not fearing for your life <laughs> which we saw so many times um so just just things like that and actually thinking that this is a team that can go all the way i mean that's that's the number one thing and i think what also ties in with that is is the defense and the defensive responsibilities and how well they carry that out with this team they're just absolute monsters physically and technically as well um, we've worked really hard to to get a really strong team that, you know, you must think going into a tunnel alongside these monsters, Gabriel, Saliba, Ben White, Calafiori now, Declan Rice. It's almost like that old adage, isn't it? Like winning the game in the tunnel, because you've got to be thinking, like, how am I going to get past these guys? And it's not only that they're monstrous, but they're so good technically as well. Um, I think that's that's such a huge thing. and And also like conceding, what was it, 29 goals last season across 38 games. It's just, you know, we've not had a defence like this in in years, probably since the Invincible. So I think those two things are really, really key. One of the big criticisms that Arsene Wenger faced in the back end of his Arsenal career was really technical sides, but lacked that physical bite and, and energy. And you're right to kind of point that out. That isn't a thing anymore. Um, you know, you look at the team, I've been calling them land of the giants recently in terms of just looking at the centre-back pair, how great they are on the ball and, and technically, but also how physically imposing they are. And then you look in the fullback positions as well. And we've got the ability to, to pick people in those positions that can also do a lot of those things. You add Declan Rice to the midfield and all of a sudden where you looked a little bit lightweight, you now have someone that is as good as anybody at getting across the ground, making challenges, using his body, even Kai Havertz. Like yeah. I've always looked at Kai Havertz and thought big player in terms of his stature, but I have to say, before he came to Arsenal, and he might have done it before he came to Arsenal, but perhaps we didn't pay such close attention. But I don't ever remember Kai Havertz putting himself about the way that he does in this Arsenal team. And so then not only is he above people on the technical level, he's above people in a physical level as well, which gives him the edge. And that's why I think he's really thrived under Mikel Arteta and come very, very good. I think, yeah, mentality is a big thing. The physical thing is is, is obviously there as well. Organisation and the way they're coached, to me, is a big one. I was watching Arteta really, really closely yesterday um, at the Emirates Cup game against Lyon. And even in a pre-season friendly, even when there was nothing at stake, even when there was 10 minutes to go in a game that Arsenal were leading by two goals to nil, and he'd made wholesale changes, he was still at the edge of his technical area, a lot of the time outside of it as well, as we know he likes to stand and orchestrating every pass, every bit of movement, making sure that out of possession people were doing their jobs. The structure is so clear. And I think the structure and stability is our biggest strength, I would say, going into the new campaign. The fact that we know what we are, we know how we're going to use that. Add to the, all of this as well, the set piece ability that we now have as well which comes partly from having a very physically dominant side and well-organized side that know how to conduct the routines that you are putting in front of them on the training ground. You've got to be really intelligent as well to take that stuff in and then to be able to maximize it and utilize it and, and produce it essentially on a match day situation. So 
I think those are, are all valid points in terms of the strengths. Weaknesses, is there a particular weakness that you worry about going into the new season? Because I've probably got a couple of points on this, but I'm interested to know what, what you think in the weakness column. Yes, I think oh, well, I'll start with what is a strength and how it proves that something else is a weakness. I think the strength to start off is the right-hand side and that combination of White, Odegaard and Saka. I think that's one of the strongest combinations, not only in the Premier League, but in world football. Like the way those three interlink um, and all have those defined roles and you know some of the football but between them, Harry, I don't think it's a stretch to say that it's beyond like prime Barcelona, like Tiki Taka, um, because the, the way, like the technical ability of those guys is just insane. Um, and if you go back and watch it, like it's almost amazing how often it is throughout the season. But when we're watching a full game, we don't notice it. It's when you see the compilations and how many times they do it, uh, how skilled they are, how often it leads to goals, chance creation, all of that sort of stuff. But then that leads me to, to say that it shows the left-hand side needs some work. And I just don't think that left-hand side has gelled as much. Um, I'm not sure we knew what the best combinations were down the left because we saw so many different ones. We saw Havertz start on, on the left day and then Martinelli on the left wing and then Zinchenko. But that changed so many times throughout the season, whether it was uh, Tommy Yasu playing the left back, whether it was Trossard coming at left wing, whether it was Declan Rice at that eight. And I think that continuity is so important to building those relationships. Um, and I just really hope that we can nail that down this season into a more fluid um, trio. And, you know, that's not going to start every game. You know, I'm not I'm not saying that. But if we can, you know, get our sort of primary three that we think really works well and use them in the, in the majority of games, and then maybe in the Champions League group stages, we switch it around a little bit, experiment with, with some other players. I, I think that's, that's really key. But obviously the, the big question mark over that is we're not sure who that left eight is going to be, whether that's going to be Marino or someone else, whether that's going to be Havertz reverting to that position and the Jesus up front. So I think that's going to be a really interesting dynamic to it and somewhere we can really improve. I think you're right to point out the left side. And I don't really know what the answer is here because you can either say that actually the fact that we can use different players on that left-hand side um, you know, depending on who we're up against, the threats that we face, some might argue that that is a strength, the fact that we've got different personnel and we can pick accordingly from week to week. I agree with you that it's probably more of a weakness, though, than anything else, because you can see that the relationships aren't quite what we have on the right hand side. And I think it's natural for a team to be slightly lopsided. You know, the side that has your better players is often going to be the more effective side. And you've seen that in a lot of teams. Naturally, you play through your best players, right? That's how it works. But I, I think last season, a number of individuals were impacted by the fact that as a collective, we didn't know what our best left-hand side was. I think whoever played left-back struggled because in Zinchenko's case, there were times where you were asking him to sit back and be a left-back which he just isn't very good at doing. And he got exposed for that. There were times where we felt that we couldn't play with Zinchenko at left back. And so we'd put a Tomiyasu or a Kivior there. But then by that same token, we were asking them to go into midfield and do a job that they're just not fit to do. And so we had a problem there. The change of the left eight, I think, impacted the relationship between whoever the fullback is and the midfield. And then that then has a knock-on effect on the left wing as well, because, you know, whether it's Martin, if it's Martinelli one week, you're going to play it one way. And if it's Trossard, you're going to play a different way. Martinelli will take you to the byline. He will play higher up. Um, he'll give you something different. His work rate is different to Trossard's. I think it's better than Trossard's. And I think he will come back and help out more. But then, you know, you've got to factor that in as well. I think the the lack of consistent relationships on that left-hand side last season was a weakness for us. And I wonder if we've done enough this summer to address that, to be able to say, right, this is our left side, or at least two thirds of it. And we're going to go with this and we're going to tweak it from time to time. But that's the main, the main sort of, uh, you know, unit that we want. I, I do worry about that as well. My other weakness is I still think we lack that killer in front of goal. 
And I know that the counterpoint to this will be, well, if you take Havertz out, though, then you don't get as much in the build-up. If you take Jesus out, you don't get as much in the build-up. But I just feel like sometimes you just need that guy in and around the box that can get one chance, take it, and win you a game. And I still don't think, at the time of recording, we've addressed that. And I don't think we're going to address that between now and the end of the window, which is probably the bigger concern. Yeah, we spoke about this on the last pod, didn't we? Do we really need it? And I think my my answer was no. But obviously, the, <laughs> if one comes knocking, then you don't say no, do you? Like, if we were to go out and sign Alexander Isak, no one's going to have a problem with that. But it's just about prioritising and how far does the budget stretch and in what areas can we make other improvements? I mean, I'm not going to be unhappy going into a season with a fully fit Jesus and Kai Havertz. But my slight concern is with Jesus's injury history, what do we do if Jesus gets injured and we've sold Eddie Nketiah? I think that leaves us a bit short because we did play Leandro Trossard there for a short space of time. But if Jesus is out for three months like he was last season, that's a real issue. Like, what do we do? Because I don't think Havertz and Trossard is enough to fill that void, personally. So my question is then... I'm saying about, you know, back up for Saka, but do we also try and sign someone? And this is obviously hard to do. I'm living in fantasy land here. Do we try and sign someone who can operate on the right wing, but also up front if need be? And that would be my my question and my hope, really. But I guess that would also depend on Reese Nelson, wouldn't it? Because I think if we were to add someone else in that forward line, probably Reese Nelson would need to go to make space for that. Um, so it's a, it's a really tricky one. And with what, just over two weeks to go, um, it's going to be tight to the deadline. But I, I just hope that I could they can pull it out. I mean, I was kind of interested to see Pedro Neto going to Chelsea because I, I feel like that would have been a player that, that suited us. Obviously, the injury history would be concerning with him, but I feel like he'd probably suit what we're trying to do. But then you've got to ask the question at 50, 60 million, is that too much for a player who's going to play second fiddle to Saka? I don't know. Yeah, that's the thing with Neto, isn't it? It was never really about his quality. It was always about whether or not it was a worthwhile investment given his fitness issues. I actually looked into this the other day, and I think we spoke about it on the pod maybe two or three days ago, where I kind of felt that the way he was being talked about was maybe overstating the impact that he's actually had in the Premier League. And I was surprised to learn actually that Gabriel at the back for Arsenal in sort of 20 more appearances in the Premier League, has actually scored more goals than Pedro Neto, which to me is is mad. Like, it blew my mind, that statistic. Um, I would have looked at Neto, but for me, the price would would have had to have been right to do that deal. And I don't think at that price point, it's something that Arsenal would do. I also agree with you on the whole, if you can get a right winger slash striker, that is the, the, the ideal solution and outcome. Um, this summer. I just think we're at a point, Mike, and I I don't know if you agree or disagree with this, where we're no longer desperate to sign players. We're sort of looking around the market and we're ready to bring in players if we think they're going to improve us. But the heavy lifting has been done. We're we're past that point where we just need to keep turning over players until we get the squad that we want. So if Arsenal fail to do that bit of business between now and the end of the window will you be angry about it or will you be able to kind of process that in your mind and say well obviously they didn't feel the right guy was out there like do you have that level of trust in the current Arsenal hierarchy now because I think I do I do have the trust in the hierarchy but as I said I think if we go into the season with the squad as it is now I would be slightly concerned just because we've got to play Champions League football and all the cups and I'm just not sure we have the required cover at the level that we need and you you, you did talk about Ethan Noeneri and Miles Lewis Kelly could they make the step up I mean potentially they could and to be fair from the bits I've seen of them in pre-season they look like they're ready but it's always a different scenario seeing them in pre-season and then actually seeing them in a Premier League game you know it's a completely different intensity the levels are, are way higher so I'd be reluctant to say that they can you know, play at Premier League level if called upon. Um, and then particularly in those two positions I've highlighted, the left A and right wing, I mean, I'm just not sure Mikel Arteta trusts Reese Nelson enough to, to come in 
and play consistently in place of Saka when Saka needs a rest because we've not seen him do it. So that just suggests to me he's not ready. The other option in that area is probably Fabio Vieira, just looking at the way he's played in preseason. Again, I'm not convinced. Um, I look at like the, the ultimate example for for positions like that at Man City, and obviously I know the financial situation at City is different, but just looking at, at their front line, apart from Erling Haaland, because Alvarez looks like he's going, on, on the right wing, they'll have the new signing, Savinho and um, Oscar Bob, who's very talented. On the left side, they'll have Grealish and Doku. And then at central attack in mid, they'll probably have Bernardo Silva and Phil Foden. And for me, like that is the depth that you need to navigate. And De Bruyne too. Positions. And, and De Bruyne. We're forgetting about De Bruyne. The, the only reason I didn't mention is because we're not exactly sure what his future holds, what sort of fitness state he's in at the moment. But I look at that as depth. Uh, and then I think we've got decent depth, but it's nowhere near that level. And ultimately, we're going to need those marginal gains, that extra level up to be able to compete with City. And, and I think as well, an important thing is going to be going further in the Champions League than we did than we did last year. I think that, you know, we'll, we'll want to see that. We can't just bow out um, at the first sign of a big team in, in a knockout game. So in, able to, in order to do that, I think we need to level up the sort of quality of play that, that we're looking at. And I'm just, and this is not me trying to be negative. I just think I'm, I'm looking at it from a, from a point of view where you need to make certain tweaks to to just jump up the the level that we need to get to. And for me, we're not quite there yet. Let me ask you one final question before I let you go. If Arsenal are only to sign one player between now and the end of the window, would you pick a midfielder or a forward? What do you think is the greater need at this moment in time? So you've only got enough money to bring in one is it a forward for you or is it a midfield player? That's so tough. <laughs> I've put you on the spot um, there. So I think just in terms of the, the starting 11, uh, I would say midfielder because I think, you know, I think Declan Rice is going to end up playing as a number six. So that covers us there. But then my question mark is who do we play at left eight? And if that is going to be, and if we want Kai Havertz to play as a number nine, because I think he is our best number nine, then that means we need to sign an eight as well. Um, I'm not convinced that our other number sixes can start in every game for us this season. Um, so I think that leads me to say number eight. And I know I've just bang, banged on about the, about the right wing position, but I'm talking about depth there. Whereas this, for me, is a bit more pressing. But that's a bloody tough question. Can't we just sign both? <laughs> I agree with you though that the, the midfield poses a greater need because of the fact that we'd, you know, we'd be relying on Thomas Partey to stay fit, which we know doesn't often happen. And obviously, I think as great as Jorginho has been since he's come to Arsenal, it's very clear that, you know, he, he isn't someone that you can play every single week and expect him to perform at that really, really high standard that we need. I think in the forward positions, we've got options and we can juggle things around a little bit, shuffle the pack a bit if needed. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you saw Kai Havertz playing as an eight again quite a bit this season. I think it was interesting that Arteta played him there behind Jesus the other day. And I actually asked Arteta about that relationship and he seems to be really excited about the combination of the two. So I wouldn't be surprised if you saw in games against the lesser teams, Arsenal being a bit more sort of open-minded and, you know, open to that thing with Rice sitting and then saying to Havertz, you've got Rice and, and Odegaard playing in there with you, just go, you know, use that license, get forward. If you've got the right left back who can tuck in alongside Rice at the six position as well in that midfield when you're attacking and that maybe protects you against the transition a bit more, that's an option too. But I think midfield is certainly the greater need at this moment. Um, Mike, thank you so, so much for joining me. There's going to be loads more content coming your way over the course of the week where we're going to be previewing uh, the brand new season. Uh, we've got a Patreon piece dropping tomorrow, um, which is about Gabriel Martinelli. We're going to look at his numbers uh, from the 22-23 season, compare them to the 23-24 season and try and figure out how he gets back to something like that level we're also going to talk a little bit about um, his future at Arsenal. Is it on the line if he doesn't deliver this time around? So we'll get into that in the coming days as well. Mike, let everybody know uh, how they can follow you and keep across all your brilliant work. Yeah, I'm on uh, Twitter at Mike underscore Stabru. That's the best place. 
Brilliant stuff. Give him a follow and you'll find links to everything there. Uh, remember, if you haven't done so already, leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel if you're brand new. If you're listening on audio, then please do leave us a review too. That really, really does help. Uh, thank you as always, and we'll see you all on the next one. Until then, up the Arsenal. Come on, you guys. Thank <laughs> you.